Um, thank you very much for being here, uh, and welcome to this year's Ed Talks. Yeah, <laughs> it's very thrilling. Um, I'm thrilled to be here. Um, uh, my name is May Martin. I'm a comedian and a writer, and I'm very excited to be hosting this uh, this Ed Talk. Um, it's going to be an hour full of goodness, because the talk this year is about how TV can be a force for good in the world. Um, I think it's very easy to blame TV for all of the ills of the world, but actually, I, I think we all know, or I hope we will, after we hear from our amazing speakers, that um, it has the potential to, to really move us forward as well and inspire action and empathy and start difficult conversations. Would you agree? Yeah, yeah great. Um, so today, we're going to be hearing from a brilliant and broad range of speakers um, on a broad range of issues. So it's everything from learning how to deliver shows with more purpose, social purpose, um, to addressing the biggest of all, uh, how to save the world, <laughs> how to save the world from climate change. Um, so all the big stuff, saving our planet. Um, should we get right into it? Yeah. Should we do it? Great. I'm very excited to listen to everyone. Um, and what better way to begin than with a five-time Emmy Award winner? Oh. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> David Collins is the creator and executive producer of the worldwide phenomenon Queer Eye, playing in 190 countries. I know. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> 190 countries worldwide, um, constantly on in my flat, constantly <laughs> streaming in the background. I've shed more tears than I thought was humanly possible. <laughs> Um, watching Queer Eye. So, um, David, yeah, the stage is yours. Please welcome that was David. Fast. Thanks. That was fast, yeah. <laughs> I apologize in advance for walking in front of you. Queer. Queer. Say it. Queer. Queer. It, it, Webster's Dictionary, it, it says it's a unique perspective, a different point of view. I was crazy to think that my life was going to be completely changed by the word queer. Uh, 18 years ago, uh, my partner, he was my, my husband and my business partner at the time, and I walked into a, an artist gallery in, in Boston's Back Bay, kind of the gay area, the South End where it was. And as we came into the room, this kind of hush happened, and we thought it was us for a second, but we realized there was this loud commotion happening in the middle. And it, it kind of got louder, and the room gets quieter. And this woman's like, look at you. Why, why can't you be like them? You look horrible. This woman just berating her husband. What are you doing? Look, look. And then, as if someone cued the movie, out of the back corner of the room came three styling, dressed gay men, champagne flutes in hand, and they surrounded him. And they put him aside. They said, no, 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 no. That's not what we do. That's not how we lift up and take care of him. Fix your hair and zhuzh his jacket and set him up a little bit. The room was silent. And I turned to my partner and I said, did you see that? That was queer eye for the straight guy. <laughs> the words came out of my mouth. And in that moment, I, I, I didn't realize, but my partner did as he turned to our best friends and he said, one year from now, this is going to be something. 18 years ago, believe it or not, uh, I sat down in front of two executives at Bravo, a little teeny network uh, owned by Rainbow Media. I said, so listen, I got this show. It's called Queer Eye for the Straight Guy. And there was a blank look in front of them. And they really took a, took a risk. They said, I have no idea what it is, but let's do it. They came up with a massive marketing campaign. Out to save the world one straight guy at a time. Via, <laughs> right? That was their, it was wonderful. Uh, via the Fab Five. The Fab Five, the original Fab Five, actually really, really broke through a lot of walls. But at the same time, in the new incarnation, we'll see the comparison. The original Fab Five were masked superheroes. They, they, they really just kind of swooped in and saved the day. They did their thing. They helped our, our straight guy, because it was Queer Eye for the straight guy then. Um, but we didn't know who they were. We didn't know who Carson was or Tom. We didn't know if, if Ted was married, which, which he was. Um, but what we did find is that these five guys would come in and lift up that straight guy. They would help breed him his confidence. Confidence breeds success. The new Fab Five. 
the new show, the reboot. We realized we had to do something different. We realized that this was a moment in time where the word queer had evolved and it had come somewhere new. Uh, the new Fab Five, let's put it this way, they are not masked superheroes. These are very unmasked men who come out and tell their truth and share their stories completely as themselves. We're gonna take a peek real quick at the trailer. Our, our show really is about the hero. We call it the episodic hero. In each one of our episodes, that hero's truth and their story gets to connect with the Fab Five. The Fab Five get to share that Karamo, uh, uh, getting married next year, uh, Tan, married to a, to a nurse, a Muslim, married to a gay Mormon uh, a nurse, by the way, who, and he himself being Mormon, um, and, and Bobby, Bobby married to another doctor. We get to learn about them all, but we get to hear Bobby's story. Bobby's story was a lot like mine. Uh, I grew up in the Midwest of, of the United States in Ohio, uh, you know, growing up in a very religious Southern Baptist church where the world, the, I was told every day, you're going to burn in hell. You're not the child that that's, you're supposed to be. He had the same thing. Our hero, Mama Tammy, which I'm going to show you in a minute, in a minute really, for me, epitomizes why the show has transformation, why the show's working right now, because Bobby got to share his truth, and she got to share her truth, and it's through that that we get to see what's next. <laughs> Believe it or not, that was completely and totally unplanned. It wasn't part of the production day. It wasn't part of the story. Mama Tammy's journey as the hero culminated here in her epiphanic moment. She grabbed the microphone to her own church and did this amazing, amazing speech. It's through that that we really realized that this, this journey for our heroes means more than anything. It's, it's truly, uh, it's, it's, it's life-changing. Most of our folks now and our heroes have gone on. Mama Tammy, by the way, speaks at churches across the United States. She speaks at events, and she's really passing it forward. This also really spoke to us at, at Scout and myself personally about our, our philosophy and our, our filter about making content, about creating television. And it really was a wonderful, epiphanic moment for us as well. Transformation through information told with comedy that has heart. That filter is what we put through all of our programming at Scout. It's quite simple. If you boil it down, transformation through information, I'm going to share with you, you're going to share with me, and by sharing our truth and connecting, I'm going to lift you up and you're going to lift me up. And when we do that, we get to see each other for who we are. We get to change. We get to have that unbelievable realization that I, I am good, I am strong. Confidence breeds success, and when we get to share that, it really does happen. Ultimately, it's an inside job. These Fab Five do an amazing job of sharing their stories with our heroes, and we get to see those heroes truly uh, see, see results. That I think 18 years ago, when I was standing inside that, that art studio, that that, that was going to be the purpose behind this? No, I didn't. But wow, what an amazing opportunity, but also an amazing responsibility. Um, I wish I could make hundreds of queer eyes. I wish everything was a queer eye, and so do the buyers. Uh, but, uh, but I can't. But what I can do, and what I have a responsibility to do, is to try and tell stories like this. Thank you. Thank you, David Collins. Um, I cried in that clip. Did you cry? Yeah. <laughs> Like that, like I'm, I was gone. Um, yeah, and can I just say that I met um, Jonathan Van Ness with long hair at the Montreal Comedy Festival and it was amazing to see the reaction just to him walking down the street. It was like he was Jesus. People were trying to touch him. <laughs> people wanted to hug him and people across all demographics too and groups of big drunk guys, intimidating groups of guys like lads um, that just wanted to hold him <laughs> and kiss yeah. him. Yeah, it, yeah. Was, it was incredible, yeah. Um, he's, he's come out as non-binary. Yes. So there's this beautiful sense of himself that whether he's in a dress with heels or jeans and a t-shirt, yeah. he is himself. And it's, it's beautiful to watch. Yeah, and in the new season when they go to his, his old they school. They go to his high school. I mean, look. <laughs> 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 okay, um, anyway, 
difficult to follow that, but we're coming at things from a different angle now, and I'm so excited. Our next speaker is Mark Stevenson. Um, Mark is one of the world's most respected thinkers on technology and societal trends. Um, so I have, a, I have a lot of questions about AI and things like that. I'm quite stressed. Um, he's the author of two best-selling books, and he's going to help us all see where the world is heading and how the TV industry needs to, to help and adapt and grow. Uh, Mark Stevenson. Thank you. Okay. Right. Uh, I have 12 minutes to do the entire future. The future I want to do about it. I'm going to start with something I found out uh, uh, last year, which is the tin can was invented in 1772. This is not the interesting thing. <laughs> the interesting thing is the tin can opener was not invented until 1855. <laughs> and I think this says something interesting about human beings. Okay. Now. Uh, I'm going to come back to this. Um, uh, I was doing some work for the European Space Agency recently, and it reminded me of this picture, uh, which is humanity's first selfie. Okay, this is a picture of the Earth taken by the Voyager space probe in the 1990s. It gave rise to a very, gave rise to a very famous speech by Carl Sagan, who said that dot should make us all feel a bit more humble. Think about the rivers of blood that were spilt by people trying to dominate just a tiny part of a pixel. At the end of this very short presentation, I'm going to show you humanity's current selfie. That's humanity's first selfie. I'm going to show you the current one. I'm going to talk about three things very quickly. Why nearly all predictions about the future are wrong, what the big context is, where we are as a planet, and what is scarce is valuable always. We must remember this, like the scarce talent that is on this uh, stage here. Now, let's talk about this. Mo most predictions are wrong. Futurists who tell you they know what's going to happen, they're vainglorious. We are shit at making predictions, and we should at it for two reasons. We're all too prejudiced. We all grew up where we grew up, in the time we grew up, with the technology we grew up. This summed up for me recently. I was stuck in a traffic jam. I looked out the window. I saw this advert for cycling. You are not stuck in traffic. You are traffic. <laughs> and I think, yeah, that's it. You just get this frame of reference. The second reason is the second reason is that all the world the world is just too complex. The second, third, fourth order effects of new technology, business model, TV program, whatever, hitting the world. Nobody knows how that's going to play out. First order effects, dead easy. Email, everybody predicts. Nobody predicts social media. Nobody predicts social media becoming fake news propagation technology. Neil Ferguson sums this up brilliantly. The law of unintended consequences is the only real law in history. An example from your own industry. Okay, it's somebody you should have known better. Harry Warner. Who the hell wants your actors talk? 1927, right? <laughs> You'd think you'd have a clue, wouldn't you? Although there is a room we had foreseen this, so who knows. Um, <laughs> uh, and he was just trying to help us out at the get-go. So who the fuck am I? I am apparently a futurist. I spent a third of my life doing this, trying to find people who've got answers to the real systemic problems and questions of future asking climate change, inequality. Um, I help my clients, these are some of the clients I work with, become future literate, understand those questions and change their business models, the way they recruit, the way they think, their strategy to answer those questions well. And, occasionally, and then occasionally I write books about this stuff and do a little bit of broadcasting. So that's who I am. Okay, so most predictions are wrong. The big context. I'm going to talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly of the next 30 years. The first thing to say is that we're going to start with the bad, because it's always good to end on a high note, right? So start with the bad, uh, but you are going to want to kill yourself about five minutes from now. So, uh, and the fact that is that everything is broken, right? Isn't it? It doesn't take more than a pint of beer on a Friday night if you to turn to the person you're with and kind of go, is it me or is the whole world fucked? Because, you know, let's just take a few examples. Democracy, haha, -ha, what we call democracy. Uh, this is democracy in the UK in 1840. This is democracy in the UK in 2019. In the same period, computing has done this. It's a fucking joke, OK? <laughs> Uh, you're laughing at that because it's true, but it's also tragic, right? This is why we have a total collapse in the trust of the institutions that shape society, whether you're in here or whether you're in America or anywhere in the world. The media, which is supposed to hold that, that uh, democracy to account, it doesn't. It's very partisan. So political philosophers will tell you that we're supposed to have a free press, right? That's one of the important things of a functioning democracy. Do we have a free press? No. It's owned by nine billionaires, most of them foreign. On one side, we have the echo chamber of sexist, racist, homophobic, phone-hacking protectors of the establishment status quo. <laughs> On the other side, we have the establishment echo chamber of nerds and catastrophists. <laughs> <laughs> and in the middle of the accountants. Now, this is not really working, OK? okay? Uh, and so what do we have? Oh, we have Newsnight, which is basically just for people to fight each other out. OK, it's all about partisanship. They don't actually question how democracy works. They just try and get somebody from the left and somebody from the right to fight each other. Why? Because that kind of journalism is cheap, and it's, uh, it grabs attention. And it's the same in the US. People are getting more and more divided because we're not prepared to talk to each other. And TV doesn't want us to talk to each other. It wants to entertain us with our divisions. This is why trust in media is plunging to all-time lows, whether you're here or in the States or anywhere else in the world. The environment. OK, Johan Rockstrom says this very well. The environment is starting to send back invoices. Whether Look at this. 17 billion dollars was the cleanup bill from just one hurricane in America last year. Okay, We have less than 60 harvests left on this planet at current levels of soil erosion. Current national policies on climate change lead us to a four-degree world. Okay, and This is where we're at. 
And even if we can solve this, we still have two meters of sea level rise baked to the system that we can do nothing about because the heat from climate change has gone into the water and it's not, and even if we stopped emitting tomorrow, that water's still gonna be there, still gonna be too hot, still melting the ice. You'll see in this report from the IPCC, we have less than 12 years to keep us below 1.5 degrees. Okay, lots of journalists, lots of scientists saying, no, also all the big finances are saying as well, legal in general, the biggest asset manager in the UK says, we are heading for a climate catastrophe in the way we spend our money. So the translation is any investment of time or money that doesn't consider the environment isn't an investment, it's a cost on the future. So here's a question for you. Hands up if you uh, care about the environment. Keep your hands up, okay. All right, keep your hand up if your organization that you work for is carbon neutral. Right, so there's something for the industry to think about. I'm joking, I'm not, I'm not joking, so I'm not joking. <laughs> I'm not joking, this is just, the world of wealth is broken, okay? This is what's happened, we've gone from George Bailey, a hero, the hero of this movie is a banker, okay? It's all about how wonderful bankers are to save us from the excesses of greed. Now with Jordan Belfort, 1% of the world's population owns 50% of the wealth. This is why the world of work is broken, okay? Why? Because, now we have 85% disengagement in the workforce. Why? Because we all now realize that our salaries are as much bribery as they are reward, because we're never working for a system that's actually complicit in destroying our own children's future. And this is now brilliantly summed up by this wonderful cartoon by Tom Terrell. Yes, the planet got destroyed, but for a beautiful moment in time, we created a lot of value for shareholders. <laughs> I quite like this cartoon as well. Dad, I'm considering a career in organized crime, government, or private sector. Son. <laughs> William Burroughs summed this up quite brilliantly in the 1960s. He said, after one look at this planet, any visitor from outer space would say, I want to see the manager. Okay. So I'm a big fan, I have a separate career as a songwriter and a comedy writer as well, so I'm a, big I'm a big fan of the power of the arts and the media to change the world. But here's my question to the TV industry, is if storytelling and TV are so powerful, why have they failed so spectacularly to create the world that we need? If you're so good at your jobs, why are we in this shit? Because nothing's changing, and it's not changing quick enough, well, things aren't changing quick enough, okay? Back to Carl Sagan, here's a quote from, 19, from 22 years ago from his book, The Demon Haunted World. I have a foreboding of a world in my children or grandchildren's time when awesome technological powers in the hands of a very few and no one representing the public interest can even grasp the issues and when the people have lost their ability to set their own agendas and knowledgeably question those in authority, when our critical faculties are in decline, unable to distinguish between what feels good and what is true, we slide almost without noticing into darkness. That is today. Now, we can fix this. You know, that's what I do. I spend my time looking for people who fix these problems. So whether it's towns in the middle of Texas going over to renewables, because it's now cheaper to use renewables in central Texas than it is to use oil. Whether it's open source systems of discovering new drugs, patient networks getting together, urban farming rebooting cities like Detroit, blockchain technology. What I found in all my work is that usually what, ch what where systems change that really works is what I call bottom-up diverse collaboration. It comes from the people, it doesn't come from the leaders. Usually democratized by a new technology, a new business model, a new way of connecting to each other. But why does it always work? It comes up time and time, why? Well, because it's the way that human, be, 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 human beings build trust. So this is how it works. First, we, sell, we share stories, okay? And when we share stories, then we can build a level of trust. Now, this person is not trying to kill me, okay? So now I will share information, stuff that's true. When I'm happy sharing information, maybe I'll start to share assets. Yes, you can. Uh, borrow my lawnmower, you can babysit my kids if you think of your kids as an asset, I mean, you know what I mean. But th things of value. This works with organizations as well as people, then people start to do projects together and then they start to question their priorities, okay? Now what's interesting about this is that uh, uh, this is lo looking at levels of socialization here, how socialized you are. And it turns out that the biggest indicator of whether you live a long and happy life is how socialized you are, okay? Not, it's more important than giving up smoking, quitting, drinking, exercise, how socialized you are. So a diverse bottom-up collaboration isn't just the way we work, it's essential to our well-being. And what's wrong with the world, and the TV industry is part of this problem, is that some at the top, usually a commissioner decides the priorities, then they decide which projects need to be done, then they decide which assets need to be cleared, then information, and they'll finally sell it to the people or the viewer. Their viewer is the last person on their mind, actually. Okay? So how do you get up this ladder? How do you get this virtual ladder? You do what I call a participation virus. This is a lot of my work is creating participation virus, and a participation virus is where the act of replication is as itself enjoyable. So there's a reason this book is called The Joy of Sex, not the actual horrible nightmare of having sex. And it's because, it's because Mother Nature very carefully, very sensibly decided that the act of replication would in itself, most of the time, be enjoyable. If having sex was like having a wasp, this audience would be much smaller, okay? Uh, consumerism does the same thing, tells us that shopping is in itself an enjoyable thing to do. So we need to make improving the future a participation virus. And this is where your skills as program makers start to meet the grand questions. How do we turn it away from just debate but into participation, collaboration? That's the good news, we can do that. And there are people on this panel who have been doing that, okay? I said I talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly. The bad is it's fucked. 
The good news is most of it is fixable except for the sea level rise. And the ugly news is it's going to get messy. All bets are off for the next 20 or 30 years. Okay? You have to change. This is not business as usual. We have 13, 14 years to save humanity, which means stop competing and start collaborating. I said I'd talk about one final thing. What is scarce is valuable always. We are not short of technology or inequality or ways the climate can kill us, or indeed stuff to watch. <laughs> and by the way, if you're going to watch anything, the next new series is <laughs> fucking amazing. <laughs> um, but what we are short of is this, empathy and collaboration. And the media does conflict. You thrive on conflict. How many times have I sat with commissioning editors and they go, your ideas are really interesting, Mark, but there's not enough conflict. Where's the enemy? That's how we tell stories. Well, that story doesn't work because it's cheap until it isn't, until we find ourselves divided and our divisions made into entertainment. We need engagement, not distraction. We need stories of collaboration, not conflict. I quite like Jesse Owens' quote, the great Olympian. He said, find the good, it's all around you. Find it, showcase it, and then you will start believing it. And as a society, as a human race, we need to start believing in good in ourselves again, otherwise we are fucked. The future is not a zero-sum game, but most of television seems to assume that it is. Somebody has to win, somebody has to lose. No, we're a co-inspirational network, and we have to work together. Some people understand this, the wonderful Luke understands this, and he's gonna talk about this next. We cannot solve the problems Society and human rights face without people like you really waking up to this and starting to work together rather than competing for people's attention. Now, I said I'd show you humanity's selfie as of today, and it was made, taken by my friend Kate. Kate's a wonderful economist. She should be on television constantly. She's come up with a way of thinking about uh, the way the economy works, and it's a very simple diagram. She says, look, uh, in the middle of this diagram, there is uh, the human race. And, and it basically says, we must agree that every single economy in the world, our, our systems must raise people above certain levels of, 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 of standards of living. They must have energy and jobs and voice and resilience and education and income and water and food. Everybody agrees that. And on the outside of the circle, she says, there's certain things that our economy can't do. We can't have too much fresh water depletion or climate change or phosphorus in the soil or soil erosion or acid in the oceans. So she says that green space, that's the safe operating space for humanity. That's where we need to be. That's what all of us, we don't care what industry, and that's what we all need to be aiming for. And some of my clients now use this as their, their, their um, uh, boardroom table to make decisions now about what they're doing. Now I'm gonna show you the latest figures from the UN based on where we are and all of those metrics. This is humanity's selfie as of today. So when you're making your programs, Maybe you want to think about that. Because unless you're getting us inside that green safe operating space, what you're doing is irrelevant at best and dangerous at worst. Philip K. Dick said, reality is that which when you stop believing in it, doesn't go away. And this isn't going away. Catherine the Great said, the great wind is blowing that either gives you imagination or a headache. <laughs> Hopefully it gives you both. This is the world you inherited. This is you. Thank you very much for your time. That was amazing. Mark Stevenson. That was amazing. I wish, I wish we could harness your personal energy as a renewable, like fuel the world off your... Um, I think, did you say that there was 99 slides in 12 minutes? That's really impressive. <laughs> I can't believe that um, about the tin can as well. Um, should we keep moving along? Yeah, wonderful. Um, our next speaker is Luke Genoer. Um, Luke creates and develops some of the best formats in TV right now. Uh, his shows like Old People's Home for Four-Year-Olds and The Restaurant That Makes Mistakes tackle some of the biggest issues in society today, always in a very entertaining, a very heartwarming and wonderful way. Um, he's definitely somebody who's finding the good in TV. Please welcome Luke Genoer. Thanks, everyone. So, good TV, good television. What do we mean by this? To me, good TV is a programme that has virtuous purpose and intent, that has a powerful message which holds a universal and undeniable truth, a truth that is uncontentious, not political or divisive, a show that makes life better. Can a programme even do that? Well, yes, it can. It can significantly improve the lives of the contributors 
and it can remind us of our core values and inspire viewers to make positive change in their society. Moreover, galvanize them into action. So over the last four years, I've had the rare pleasure of creating and working on two such projects with CPL and with Channel 4, the um, old people's home for four-year-olds and the restaurant that makes mistakes. So I should probably thank, um, take this time to kind of thank all the brave and amazing contributors who, um, who took part in those shows and really trusted our vision. Um, and this afternoon, I'm going to share my thoughts and discoveries from developing and producing those two shows and my feelings on what we can do as an industry to encourage and foster more programmes of this nature. So um, can ethical, fa ethical factual be considered a new genre? It's essentially a kind of a social action project that previously would have been the subject of documentaries, but we've turned them into entertaining formats with experimental elements. Now, most broadcasters kind of think there isn't an audience for this type of show, but there is. We took Old People's Home to many channels and it was turned down every time until Channel 4 eventually took it because they loved it. They loved the tape so much. And we proved that shows like this do pick up big audiences. The first series of Old People's Home was the highest rating new format for Channel 4, only behind Bake Off. The format has sold internationally, rating even higher in Germany, making hit versions in Spain, Sweden, Holland, and soon in Australia. Um, so people are coming to these types of shows. They're touching a nerve and they're tapping into a zeitgeist. So maybe even watching the show makes, a feel, makes the viewer feel that they're doing good. It's just like hitting like or share on a kind of an opinionated call to action Facebook post. So let's see a clip of Old People's Home for Four Year Olds. So, yeah, still love that show, still cry when I watch it. But um, yeah, we, we were kind of just researching alternative ways to how we can care for the oldest in our society. We knew it was a problem, and so we came across this nursing home in America, as we mentioned there. And they were putting the oldest in society with the youngest in a, in a nursery that was embedded into the home. So when we spoke to them, it emerged that they had never scientifically tested the approach. They didn't need to, they just knew it worked. I suppose as you see on the screen there, you just see the, the chemistry between those two generations. Um, the residents were happier, more active, more engaged. The children were looked after, they developed faster, they grew up appreciating their place within society. So I had two immediate questions being a um, TV developer. I said, why aren't we doing this in the UK? and what would happen if we could test the effectiveness of this approach scientifically. So the sizzle we made had lots of people in tears. I always test um, our taster tapes on the office manager, Jess. If she cries, then we're winning. <laughs> so um, the format was simple. It was emotive. It was timely. It was solving a problem in society, and it was super cute. But we deliberately chose to make the show a bit differently. We felt that with the strength of the intergenerational experiment was powerful enough on its own. We didn't need a hero. We didn't need Jamie Oliver telling us we were doing it wrong. There was no campaign. We just had something that was tangible, visceral, and it could take on a life of its own. So we chose an approach that wasn't didactic, um, like in more classical factual television. And I suppose this way of approaching the show empowers the audience and it encourages them to take matters in their own hands. Um, so I've got a second clip for you that hopefully shows the impact the show had on the contributors. So in both series, all of our older adults became happier, fitter, and more able in a really short period of time, all because of the show and because of the kids. Um, but one of the surprising things was the longevity and depth of the friendships that were formed. Like Ken and Lily, they still have Sunday lunch together now. They still do it. Um, but we knew when we were making the show, we knew that if no one watched the show, we could still be proud that what we'd done just for the 10 older adults and 10 children in the experiment, we just knew it had worked. Um, luckily, people did watch it. We were trending on Twitter, it was in all the newspapers, the office phone was ringing with people asking how they can link their children with the retirement community. Um, and since the first programme, the show has won awards all over the world, it's been twice BAFTA nominated, and more importantly, there are now over 40 old people's homes in the UK that are simultaneously running a nursery facility on site. Um, <laughs> You know, even being contacted by Matt Hancock, the Secretary of State for Health, who has consulted with us to how to roll out a similar scheme in nationally, maybe when we've sorted Brexit out. <laughs> so um, I'd also like to talk about our other show, The Restaurant That Makes Mistakes. Um, here, here's what we did if you, if you missed it. So, um, yeah, I love this show. It's very special and perfectly marries a growing problem with an unlikely solution, much like in Old People's Home for Four-Year-Olds. Um, Last year, dementia 
uh, took over heart disease as the leading cause of death in the country. And over 42,000 people who are under 65 and live with the condition, um, only 18% continue to work. So that's kind of where we were kind of going with that, that idea. So the results were amazing from that show. Um, just giving the volunteers a purpose, a group of new friends and confidence in the abilities that they do still have made an amazing difference to their lives. But there were some improvements we didn't expect. So we only did it for five weeks. Some of the volunteers, um, their depression and anxiety disappeared. It was replaced by self-esteem and confidence. They improved their language, fluency of speech, their balance, and many of them went on to go and have uh, lots of jobs afterwards. So the show literally changed their lives. But to have good TV, you need to have good ideas. So how do we do it? Let's not give you all the secrets, but generally we should all be making shows that try to change the world. It's okay to have that ambition, why wouldn't we? We work in an industry that has the potential to reach millions of people and change their minds and influence them for the better. And I know this sounds a bit naive or a bit hippy-dippy, but I don't think it is. I think it should be our intention to do this. So, I mean, could we make The Apprentice but for the unemployed? Could we make Location, Location, Location for homeless people? Come dine with me at the food bank? Queer Eye for the environment? Why not? So without meaning to get too political, budget cuts, disappearing social services, 10 years of austerity, mean we live in a Britain that needs fixing. Um, and having a bigger world view, um, having, being ambitious with your goal is what we do at CPL. And we kind of regularly try to solve all world problems in a Monday morning brainstorm. Um, but all of our shows are kind of, they're good ideas independently of whether they're a TV show or not. And I suppose that's the point. Um, we always try to solve um, solve problems using surprising solutions that go against conventional wisdom. Um, so that if the government aren't doing their job, we need to come up with ideas that people can do for themselves. Often these ideas are bizarre and simple as well as being entertaining. And we search out for things that communities and individuals can replicate. So for example, we've been working on uh, an idea whether putting a dog's home in a community can reduce crime levels. It totally can and it would work. And it's a perfect journey of a problem with a left field solution. Um, it always helps, of course, if similar schemes already exist, um, and these ideas then aren't just a TV construct, they're kind of an elevation of something that is already happening in the world. Um, so yeah, just to summarize, this, this type of programming has been described as ethical factual. Um, this means that the intention of the program sets out to change society, that, is, that it is morally correct, that it has a noble purpose, you cannot deny on a human level, and it's principled in its application, and more importantly, these shows do have an audience. So I think TV, well, I think TV still is one of the most powerful influences in society, and we have a duty to try and harness that power and make a better place to live. So let's try and change the world one show at a time. Thank you very much. Luke. <clears throat> that was amazing. I cried again. Cried at Ken in the treehouse. Um, <laughs> oh, boy. Um, that is amazing to, to tackle such heavy things without straying into the, the morose in a kind of voyeuristic way. Like I, I was just thinking watching that, how many documentaries I've seen about dementia and that have this tragic soundtrack, just the scoring of that to, to make it uplifting and have humor and don't you think? Yeah. yeah, like not this sort of violin music. Yeah, anyway. Yeah. Um, <laughs> finally, our final speaker. I'm so excited, what a way to finish. Um, I'm about to introduce Orla Doherty, who's the executive producer at BBC Studios Natural History Unit. Um, very remarkable career, Orla. I don't need to tell you that. Um, she spent 10 years at sea studying the remote coral reefs of the Pacific Ocean. Most recently, spent 500 hours um, at depths of 1,000 meters. I'm so scared of the ocean. I can't, I, I find it very scary. I think it's amazing. I, and more people have been to the surface of the moon than to the bottom of the ocean. Is that, yeah. Well, cool. Um, <laughs> just checking. Um, Anyway, we're very, very lucky. She's um, the producer of Blue Planet, and we're very lucky to have you here on dry land. Please welcome Orla Doherty. It's 12 men to the moon have actually stood on the moon, and three men boring, <laughs> have been at the deepest part of the ocean. It's crazy. Yes, it is crazy. It is crazy. Um, it's very nice to be back in this festival because I haven't been here since the mid-1990s uh, when I was working in Janet Street Porter's department at the BBC. <laughs> Did I hear laughter? Um, myself and a young lady called Emma Swain were dispatched here 
to make a film with a young gentleman called Normski. <laughs> yes, now we're really hearing after. And it was a film about how to get into television. So obviously I followed all his advice and here I am. Um, single use plastic is a phrase that is now as household as the cotton buds and plastic bags and water bottles and all the things that make up that bucket of stuff. But actually, it's really not that long since we didn't really know what that meant. We certainly didn't really grasp the implications of our fondness for it. Scenes like that, um, they had a massive impact when they hit the air. And in many ways, they continue to have an impact. Um, I don't think that work is done by any stretch of the imagination. I started out in, in populist uh, factual telly, um, hanging out with Kevin MacLeod making grand designs, um, hanging out with Lisa Tarbuck making She's Gotta Have It. It's like really fun TV. And then I found something more exciting to do. I love telly, but I found something even more exciting to do with my life, and that was scuba diving. And the minute I put my head underwater, that was it. Everything changed forever. I had to leave London. There aren't any coral reefs in London, apart from in aquariums. And I ran away to sea. I didn't really mean to stay away for 10 years, but I did, because uh, I loved it that much. Um, I fell in love with coral, and then I watched that bleach as our seas warmed up. I fell in love with fish, with their incredible shapes, colors, personalities, and I watched them being hoiked out on a biblical scale. I fell in love with sharks, and I watched them actually get finned in front of me so their fins could go in a soup in a Chinese restaurant. And I came back with all of this stuff, all of these images in my head, and I didn't quite know what to do with it until I heard that the incredible Natural History Unit were making a follow-up series to Blue Planet 2. So I stuck my hand right up in the air and said, pick me. I've seen a lot, I know a lot, and I really want to tell the world about it. When I was out at sea, I was with a tiny NGO, and we were trying to be a, t a big voice for a big world, the ocean, and we just couldn't quite punch through. But I figured that perhaps the Natural History Unit and the BBC could. We... Um, we had one focus with Blue Planet 2, and that was to find new stories, because we figured if we could find new stories and new behavior, even new worlds, and use new technology to tell them, then we might be able to have our audience fall in love with the ocean. And if they fell in love with the ocean, we thought by stealth we might get them to actually get involved with what's going on in the ocean. So we worked with everyone out there with eyes on the ocean, and that's scientists, fishermen, divers, oceanographic institutions, marine biologists. We launched 125 shoots. We filmed in 39 countries, which actually is a bit of a meaningless fact because the ocean doesn't do national borders. <laughs> and we filmed nonstop for three years. One of the most ambitious shoots we attempted was my last one. So we'll just watch a moment from it. So is, is our remit to take you all and our, all of our audiences around the world to parts that we can't ordinarily get to? And really, it's not ordinary to get into a submersible and, and go to the bottom of the sea at the bottom of the world. We didn't really know what we were going to find, and we were gobsmacked, blown away by what we found. And if you haven't watched the deep episode, watch it, because there's five minutes of life in the deep sea of Antarctica, and it is mind-bending. It's even more mind-bending when you're sat in a sub going, oh my god, please, 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 I hope the cameras are going to work and actually capture this, because nobody's coming back here for a while. 
It's also quite mind-bending when you're 450 meters deep and it's your very first dive in Antarctica and the submarine starts leaking. <laughs> not, not exactly ideal. Um, however, stuff happens when you're going to the very edge of where we know on this planet you're obviously putting a huge amount of effort into mitigating any risk that there can be, but you are going to the edge. We only do it with the best of the best. So when there was water gathering in the bottom of the submersible and you're thinking it's really cold out there, <laughs> but that's actually irrelevant because if we blow, we're just going to vaporize with the pressure. We're with the best of the best of the best who can just keep their heads, which helps us keep our heads and just get the job done. And look, I'm here, it's all fine. <laughs> we did not set out to make a, an environmental series. And at the same time, in all of those shoots, in all of those expeditions, there's nowhere that we went, including for me at the bottom of the ocean, where we did not see our thumbprint on our seas. There was no way that we couldn't include that in our programming. It simply had to be told. It would have been disingenuous, downright lying to not expose that. So one of the most um, prevalent and probably relevant issues and thumbprints we were seeing was plastic. And we captured the imagery of it wherever we could and really thought long and hard about what to actually do with that. And these are the facts on plastic. So only one to 3% of plastics around the world are recycled. 10% of that 97% ends up in the ocean and that does add up to 8 million tons a year. That's a lot of plastic. We've seen it everywhere. The clip at the front, the albatross, um, that broke people's hearts. It broke my heart when, when that story came back from South Georgia. Um, coupled with a pilot whale mother grieving her calf who may have died because of the chemicals attached to plastic that may have been around it. Coupled with a sperm whale baby playing with a blue plastic bucket. We knew that these images would tell such a powerful story. I don't think we quite knew what the impact would be. So the final episode, Our Blue Planet, where we went with scientists to the front line of understanding what they're trying to find out about our ocean and what state it's in and what we've done to it and what we might do to try and fix it. That aired in November 2017, and it had really quite an impact. Um, 14 million viewers, let me just switch the slides. Um, the, in general, the series, I mean, you can, you can read all the stats. It's massive, 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 massive. I won't read that for you. Huge reach, huge impact, recognized. But I think for us, these, these are amazing, absolutely amazing, amazing, amazing. But it's the legacy, it's the follow on from this initial um, bomb of implosion of reaction to it and it's what actually then happened then where did the story go and it's things like knowing that there's now uh, attempts at really trying to eradicate single use plastic in this country there's the EU making legislation to get rid of it it's, it's happening and don't get me wrong, I'm not saying it's happening because of Blue Planet 2. We did not do the heavy lifting. We did not do the work. But we were the great big foghorn shouting about the work that had been done. And that was us being able to act as a force for good. One of the scientists that we worked with, Professor Richard Thompson, really captured it. There's a quote from him on the next slide. He said, a few minutes of coverage by Blue Planet 2 has done more to raise awareness than the decades of underlying research could ever have done alone. And I think for me, that was the, um, the verification and the, and the sort of silent, gentle pat on the back, not, God, you're brilliant, but 
you've done your job. Our job was to put the ocean on everybody's agenda, to get people really thinking about it, talking about it, but most importantly, getting up off their sofas and doing something about it. There was a poll after Our Blue Planet and nearly nine out of 10 people who had watched that episode said that their attitude and their behavior around plastic had changed. That's amazing. I'm so out of time. I'm so out of time. I'm so sorry. It's not fixed. Plastic isn't fixed. It's a giant problem. It's not going to go away with one TV series. It's massive. But there's just an awful lot more work to do. So <laughs> we're doing it. Um, at the Natural History Unit, we have launched the next giant ocean voyage. It's unbelievably exciting and terrifying at the same time. And we are working with our partners, Ocean X Media, on this incredible vessel. We're making a series for National Geographic. So it's us pushing out into our amazingly exciting world where we're acting as an independent studio. So working for National Geographic and making a series, again, putting the spotlight on the ocean, putting a spotlight on the issues that are in it. We're incredibly, incredibly lucky to have James Cameron as an executive producer on it. Um, I've known him through the ocean through our connection through that for 20 years. And his Hollywood work is obviously second to none. But what impresses me about him more than anything is his passion for the ocean. And he puts his, not his money, he puts his life and time where his mouth is. He built a submersible of his own. He is one of those three men that have been to the deepest place on earth in a submersible that he built because he wanted to explore and he wanted to talk about the ocean. So we have so much more work to do. Um, the ocean's really big. There's a lot going on out there. There's a lot for us to talk about. There's a lot more for us to share. I'm very, very glad I came out of early retirement to get involved with Blue Planet 2. I don't think I'm gonna be retiring anytime soon again because we've just got a hell of a lot of work to do. Thank you very much. so much. Um, thank you, Orla, and thanks to all our, our brilliant speakers, David, Mark, Luke, and, and Orla. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I hope that everybody's leaving with a sense of optimism and a sense of responsibility as well moving forward and we've seen all the good that has been done and is still to do um, and all that remains is for me to thank our session sponsors bbc studios and to thank you all for attending and being such a wonderful audience thank you very much enjoy the festival <laughs> <laughs>